When I say the word bird, what comes to mind? Probably not a penguin, not an ostrich either, almost certainly not a kiwi. You probably thought of something small, something that flies, perhaps a robin. But why? Why is a robin somehow more bird than a bird that also technically is a bird? The answer has nothing to do with feathers or beaks or wings. It has to do with the way your mind, without your permission, builds invisible hierarchies. It silently seems to rank the world, not by truth, but by familiarity. We don't think in definitions. We seem to think in prototypes. And in the next few minutes, I want to show you how this one small fact quietly shapes almost everything you believe. And why, perhaps even without meaning to, you've probably mistaken what's typical for what's true. More times than you know. When we look at the world, we like to think that we see it clearly, objectively, that we group things according to their real essence, what they truly are. But we don't. We group things according to what we expect them to be. This is the quiet operation of the prototype, a mental blueprint formed not by logic, but by repetition. It's not the definition of a bird that springs to mind, but the image of one. Round, feathered, perched on a branch, probably singing. And so the robin wins. It is not more correctly a bird than the ostrich, but it is psychologically a better fit for the fuzzy mental sketch that we've drawn without even realizing it. This is what the psychologist Eleanor Roche proposed in the 1970s, that our minds do not draw neat lines around categories. Instead, they arrange them in concentric circles, with the most typical, most vivid, the most familiar being at the center, and the rest trailing outwards like faint paint. A robin is a better bird in the same way that an apple is a better fruit than a fig, or a car is a better vehicle than a unicycle. Not because it fits the category logically, but because it fits it comfortably. And what we find comfortable, we tend to trust. The danger, if we can call it that, is not in having prototypes. It's in forgetting that we do. Every day, without effort or announcement, we navigate the world through these silent reference points. When someone says vehicle, we do not picture a um, skateboard, even though it qualifies. We think of a car. When someone says furniture, we don't think of a grandfather clock or a hammock. We think of a couch. It feels trivial, even humorous. But beneath this innocent shortcut lies something far more consequential, and that is the illusion of obviousness. We assume things belong, or don't, based on their resemblance to what we already know rather than their reality. And when something deviates from that imagined center, when it falls just outside the bounds of our inherited mental print, it feels strange, suspicious, even wrong. This is how the weird becomes just that, how the unexpected becomes almost an anomaly. We don't reject it because it's untrue, we reject it because it doesn't fit. And it is exactly this cognitive gravity that always pulls us towards the familiar that shapes not only how we name things, but how we value them. What's remarkable is that this way of thinking, that is, categorizing based on central examples rather than definitions, wasn't always obvious. For most of Western thought, categories were seen as rigid. Something either was or wasn't a thing, based on fixed criteria. This was the legacy of Aristotle. In his short work, Categories, he laid a framework in which everything that existed could be cleanly sorted by fixed traits and definitions into one of ten neat categories, like an action, or a time, or a place. But Eleanor Roche's work on prototypes challenged that view and argued that categories aren't fixed at all. Some things are simply better examples of a concept than others. Now don't get me wrong, prototypes aren't inherently bad. In fact, there is a very good reason why our brains incepted them in the first place. The world is too vast and multidimensional to fully perceive, so our minds must compress, we summarize, we generalize, we reach instinctively for the most representative, not the most accurate necessarily. And in a way, in doing so, we survive. A prototype makes unfamiliar terrains manageable. It lets you walk into a room and know roughly where to sit, 
It lets you glance at an object and know without deeper thought or analysis whether you can eat it or wear it or run from it. Now these approximations or mental shortcuts offer us not only speed but also immediate clarity and even predictability. Without them, life would feel too overwhelming by virtue of its own complexity. But without careful scrutiny, this can quickly, yet quietly, become rather dangerous. That is when prototypes don't just help us interpret the world, they start to define it. We stop noticing how much of our perception is pre-written, how our expectations are not neutral but heavily lopsided and built from the remains of past exposure instead of fresh observation. And when the real world presents something that doesn't match our inner sketch, something that challenges the mental images we didn't even know we had drawn, we don't usually redraw the sketch. We dismiss the new information as invalid. So while prototypes simplify reality, they can also suppress possibility. They so sneakily teach us what's normal, what's obvious, what's desirable, and therefore, by implication, what is not. These implications are so subtle and so seemingly innocent that we don't notice when we start applying these mental blueprints not only to objects, but to people. At some point, whether we realize it or not, the prototype ceases to be a guide and becomes a standard. We all carry in us universal templates, a vague picture of what a leader looks like, a scientist, a mother, a terrorist. These are not conclusions we've reasoned our way into, but impressions we've absorbed through stories, social media, news headlines, history. The danger of these mental outlines is not that they exist, but that they masquerade as common sense. We do not realize that we are looking through a biased lens. We think that we are looking directly. And so, when someone appears who does not match the prototype, like a black man entering a luxury store, there is a cognitive pose, a sense, however fleeting, of incongruence. It's not that such a person is unthinkable, it's more that we haven't thought of them enough. And that, precisely, is how the prototype transforms into a stereotype. The stereotype tells us what to expect of others. And with time, those expectations begin to shape not only our judgments, but the realities of other people. Who gets hired? Who gets prosecuted? Who gets believed? Who gets arrested? Stereotypes are not simply inaccurate, they are limiting, and perhaps the most sobering truth of all is that we have never thought to question the stereotypes that inhabit our minds. Now again, this isn't to villainize a system that has helped our brains survive immediate threats. In many ways, simplifying and condensing information do allow the brain to survive its own limits. But just because the mind is a pattern-seeking machine doesn't mean that it isn't also a pattern-revising one. Every time you encounter something that doesn't match the mold, you stand at a fork to dismiss it or to let the brain redraw the mold. And this is how prototypes evolve. I always wonder, if the mind constantly draws maps of the world without your knowing, what part of the world have our minds already erased? And if we rediscover them at some point, will we realize that we have encountered them before, albeit with a different level of awareness that could not accommodate them at that point? Now, prototypes are one of the many ways inherited biases manipulate and determine our perceptions and thought processes. Language and culture are not neutral bystanders in our cognitive landscape either. If you're interested in exploring how these shape your perception and reality, you can check out other videos I made on the subject.